Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Medill this evening. We're very glad to have you here for a very, very important evening in our Medill programming this fall. This is the second annual uh, Cecilia Weissman Award presentation, and um, we will be uh, honoring someone every year at Medill. So I would like to start our program by introducing Charles Whitaker. Charles, welcome. Thank you, Stacy. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this presentation of the Cecilia Weisman Award. This award was created to honor the life and legacy of an esteemed colleague who was taken from us much too soon. Cecilia Weisman was an amazingly thoughtful and talented journalist, a dedicated and inspirational teacher, and a beloved member of the Medill family. When a group of student leaders came to us several years ago to propose an award in Cecilia's honor, it wasn't an aha moment. It was an of course moment. Of course, we would want to do something to honor and preserve the memory of our dear colleague who in a relatively short time gave so much to this community and everyone she encountered. We're grateful not only to those students, most of whom with Cecilia's help have gone, have graduated and carried on her legacy and the amazing work they're doing in the field. But we're also grateful to our partners in the National Association of Hispanic Journalists for joining us to make this award a possibility. It's our pleasure to present this year's award a winner, Maria Anna Zamudia of Chicago's public radio station, WBEC. Mar Maria's amazing work is certainly in the spirit of the insightful and illuminating journalism that Cecilia was so devoted to producing and teaching. And we're very pleased to honor her this evening. Before we get to that presentation, however, I'd like to introduce Gary Marks, Cecilia's husband, who'd like to say a word or two on behalf of the family. Gary? Thank you so much, Charles. I would like to thank Medill, NAHJ, and especially Charles and Mei Ling for continuing this award in honor, in Cecilia's honor. Cecilia's professional life was dedicated to promoting diversity and nurturing the next generation of journalists focused as she was on telling stories about people and issues that are often misunderstood, misrepresented, or ignored altogether. This award carries on her legacy in a very real way. And I speak from the heart when I say that our two children, Anna and Andres, and our entire family are grateful. I would like to say a few words about Ceci, as I called her, for, Mar for Mar Maria Inez and others who did not know her. Ceci was born in Argentina and came to the US as a baby with her parents and three siblings. She grew up in New Jersey. Her mother Carmen loved opera and cooking. She made wonderful empanadas and gnocchis from scratch and worked in factories before becoming a pattern maker in New York City. Her father, Adolfo, was a dreamer, a businessman, and a rabid supporter of the Boca Juniors soccer team. Ceci attended Barnard College, where she joined the college radio station and NPR after graduation. Her dream was to produce long form radio documentaries in Latin America, and that's exactly what she did. I recently listened to one of her earliest stories from the Amazon and Ceci's voice was filled with excitement, wonder and adventure of a young journalist on the road. Some of us on this Zoom call remember that feeling. It was beautiful. Ceci was an artist, a musician, a great pl bass player in her youth and sound was sacred to her. That's why she was drawn to radio, especially the human voice. She was thoughtful, generous, warm, and kind. It has been five years since Ceci's death and we miss her terribly. Maria Inez, I can think of no one more worthy of this award than you. What is it about your reporting that reminds me of Ceci's journalism? The voices. Your piece, pieces are anchored in real people, whether you are covering the impact of the Supreme Court's latest decision on DACA, the battle over gentrification in Pilsen, or Latinos' love of plants. 
Your stories are powerful because those most affected are the ones front and center speaking to the audience. You let them speak rather than speaking over them. But your story shall in, share another element with Sessie's work, hope. Sessie and several colleagues did an entire series from Latin America called Searching for Solutions. How rare is that in journalism? Like Sessie, you often covered grim topics, violence, poverty, racial injustice, to name a few. But I come away as a listener thinking that this reporter believes that our very imperfect nation can and will do better. That yes, there is promise and there is hope. In your journalism, you not only treat your interviewees with respect, which is felt by the audience, but you often highlight community leaders and others who are not just complaining about problems, but working to solve them. Like the activists you profiled, profiled who are pushing Chicago leaders to ease the water shortages in black neighborhoods. By doing this, you are giving your audience a rare gift in these difficult times when journalism, rather than providing a trusted platform for a divided nation, is too often mired in cynicism, superficiality, and yes, partisanship. You've earned our trust as, as listeners, and that is the highest praise for our profession. Of course, there are many other things I admire about your work, your expertise on immigration and other important issues, your thoughtfulness, your determination, your ability to find the small nugget that can shape a powerful narrative and your ability to draw on your lived experiences to inform your work. These are all elements that Ceci taught in her classes at Medill and what distinguished her work and now distinguishes yours. So on behalf of Ceci's entire family, I send you via, via Zoom the warmest congratulations. Felicidades. Thank you, Gary, very much for that wonderful tribute. Now let me turn the proceedings over to my colleague, Professor Mei Ling Hopgood, a distinguished professor and journalist in her own right, but who also happens to be the advisor of the student chapters of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, as well as the advisor for the Asian American, the student chapter of the Asian American Journalists Association. Uh, Mei Ling, uh, she also was one of Cecilia's closest friends, which is why I can think of no one more fitting to conduct this, uh, this interview tonight. Mei Ling. Thank you so much, Charles and Gary. You know, I should know following you, I'd like be on the verge of tears, but um, we are so happy to be here tonight to um, both honor Cecilia and Maria Ines. Um, Cecilia and I started at Medill in 2012 at the same time. We both had very close connections, obviously, to Argentina. I had just moved here from South America so I'm from South America, from living in Buenos Aires, and we taught together and we uh, started the bilingual journalism English Spanish class and the journalism residency program in Argentina. And I admired so much about her and I miss her so much. But one of the things, and Gary said it so well, you know, she had this talent for listening, for really truly listening, for, uh, for really hearing, for meaning, for, um, the most personal parts of story for the concerns of students. She was so um, compassionate with students. She had so much passion for her family, for her friends, and for her creative work. So again, um, Gary couldn't have said it better. We're so um, happy to have Maria Inez as the recipient of this award. Um, Maria Inez is an investigative journalist and part of the race, class, and communities team at WBEZ. Before this, she worked um, for American Public Media's investigative team. She has also worked for the Memphis Commercial Appeal and the Chicago Reporter Magazine. Her stories have appeared in the Associated Press, New York Times, National Public Radio, our own NBC Chicago, um, Telemundo, and Univision. In 2015, she and a team of reporters from Latino USA received a Peabody National Award for their coverage of Central American migrants. And I thought as we begin the conversation with Maria Inez, 
I would like to play, before we begin the conversation, I would like to play a little clip from that story. I would warn our listeners that this, um, these three minutes are very um, are graphic and they refer to um, sexual harassment and assault. So please uh, take care. So this is um, a clip from her story about the plight of women migrants. Each year, about 400,000 Central Americans migrate to the U.S. through Mexico. They face theft, extortion, kidnapping, and even death. About one-fifth of them are women. For them, the trip is even riskier. Rape is so common that smugglers sometimes require migrant women to take contraceptives before the trip. Maria Inés Amudio reports on the dangers Central American women face on their journey to El Norte. Tobias is sitting quietly near the train tracks about 20 miles north of Mexico City. She's a single mother from El Salvador traveling to the U.S. border on top of a freight train called La Bestia, the Beast. Not everyone dares to jump on top of this train. Elizabeth is hungry. It's been more than 24 hours since she ate, and then it wasn't much. She can't remember the last time she had a full meal. But eating is the least of her worries. Being on top of a train is really dangerous. And especially if you're a woman traveling with only men, it's something really risky. You're in danger of everything. I felt fear that I hadn't felt before. The first night was the most scared I had ever been. Elizabeth, who's 32, has faced endless sexual harassment on her journey. It started the minute she crossed the border from Guatemala into Mexico. Her smuggler demanded to sleep with her. I know that some people have sex with smugglers, but I paid him so that he would respect me, but he didn't. He treated me badly. I ended up sleeping in a park. The smuggler took the $3,000 she paid him at the beginning of the trip and left her stranded in southern Mexico. She decided to go on anyway. Along the way, she picked up a job as a house cleaner. It was there that she was almost forced into prostitution. The owner of the house wanted to sell me to other men. I heard him on the phone saying, I have the Salvadoran woman. Whoever wants to sleep with her has to pay me 200 pesos. I grabbed my things and I left. I told him, sir, I'm not a prostitute. I'm just a person that's looking for a better future. Elizabeth is not alone. For thousands of women journeying north, sexual exploitation is an occupational hazard. About six in 10 Central American migrant women experienced rape and other forms of sexual assault in Mexico, according to Amnesty International. Thank you. Um, Maria Inez, welcome. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much for this. Yes. So I, I wanted to start our conversation uh, with giving us, uh, giving you guys a story um, that really has brought me to where I am right now. Um, so I'm just gonna start. Um, you know, Chicana feminist uh, Gloria Ansaldúa is someone that I deeply admire, and she wrote, "I write to record what others erase when I speak, to rewrite the stories others have miswritten about me, about you." This is a pretty, pretty accurate description of my work. And the surprising thing is that I didn't always feel this way. I started my career in a small newspaper, the Salinas Californian. This paper covers the farming communities in, in the central coast of California. And then one of my stories went national. The headline on CNN read, 
Man sold teenage daughter into marriage for cash, beer, and meat. I had been afraid this would happen. But the story behind that headline is a more nuanced one. It's a story that starts with an influx of indigenous immigrants from Oaxaca, Mexico into towns like Greenfield, California, where they go to the fields and pick fruits and vegetables. Marcelino de Jesus Martinez was accused of arranging the marriage of his 14 year old daughter to his 18 year old neighbor. Both families are trique. Both families didn't speak English or Spanish. And this type of dowry is normal in their culture. In this case, the dowry involved beer, $16,000 and other items. A triki leader told me that his community is autonomous and women are not forced into marriage. The women always have the option of leaving that arrangement if they talk to their father. As I continued covering this story, it was clear to me that this was a layered one and it would be difficult to report. This indigenous communities in Greenfield were for the most part left alone. As long as they worked in the fields, no one bothered them. No one told them, that, no one told anyone in this community that it is illegal in this country for young girls to marry older men. When I covered this angle of the story, Actually, I covered every angle of the story, including a front page profile of a beautiful tricky woman named Gloria Merino. Gloria's mother died when she was five years old and three years later, she was sold into marriage. Her life was difficult to hear, filled with pain and trauma, but it was also very hopeful. It was a story about a woman who found freedom, freedom from the men who controlled her and abused her. And she trusted me with that story. On a different night, when I was covering a heated meeting between the local police department that arrested Marcelino and his community, a white colleague and I were covering it. Um, I was there to serve as his translator. And as we drove back to the newsroom, he told me that the little girls I had been talking to before the meeting paid very close attention to me during the meeting. As I took notes and interviewed people, they stared at me. So he, so my colleague told me, Maria, they look up to you. And that's when it hit me. There are so few of us doing this work that we take on a new level of responsibilities. You see, up until, up until this point, I had been very frustrated. I was not only covering my own beat, but I was also covering the Latino beat. It, I was very frustrated because I didn't want to be the Latina reporter covering Latino issues. I wanted to be an investigative reporter. I wanted to cover city hall. I wanted to cover government. I wanted to be like my white colleagues. And working on this story early on in my career forced me to accept that I would always have that responsibility to cover my community. And that this would be something that I would have to take on in addition to my job and probably without compensation or recognition. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And that is why I am extremely proud to receive the Cecilia Weisman Award. I see this award as an affirmation to my work. What I'm doing, not only on the air, on the boards that I serve, supporting other journalists and silently creating opportunities for other journalists of color matters. I see this award as a message from Cecilia, someone I never got an opportunity to meet, but whose legacy lives on her work and the people that she touched. I intend to keep her legacy alive by telling our stories and creating opportunities for other marginalized communities. Lastly, I wanna take a moment to dedicate this award to my mother, Sibelis, my mother has experienced more trauma than I will ever understand. She's dedicated her entire life to her family. She's taught me compassion and resilience. A woman who couldn't go to school, but understood the importance of education. When she was criticized for letting her Mexican daughter go to school, she told me, I may not have the money to help you pay for school, but you have my support. Gracias, ma. And to my guiding force, my angel, 
my sister Alma, who passed away three years ago. And obviously, Cecilia, without her, I wouldn't be here. And for that, I, I'm really grateful for Gary's kind words uh, that really touched me. So Maylene, please, if you have any more questions. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I wanna invite our attendees to ask questions. I will, I will channel them, we're in a webinar, but we, we definitely will see your questions. So please, I hope that I'm not gonna dominate the conversation. Um, I was wondering how you ended up doing audio um, storytelling and what you feel about the particular medium um, you bring alive so many voices there, you know, you, we can hear them with you, but you know what, how did you end up here? And do you prefer audio? Um... Yeah, so I, you know, I started my career in, in newspapers and, um, and then I moved on to uh, magazines, but really I've always loved audio. In fact, um, in college, I took a um, uh, an international reporting class and we produced a, a radio story. So it's always been something that I uh, feel a deep connection to, but, you know, I never really pursued it in school. Um, I had this idea of like who I wanted to be. I wanted to be this like investigative journalist that worked for a newspaper. Um, and then when I started traveling to, um, Mexico and, and Central America doing the kind of reporting that I was doing. Um, I bought myself a little recorder and I was like, let me just record everything I can and then figure out a way to put it together. And um, so it became like a hobby of mine where I would, you know, work on a story and then, you know, bring my recorder with me. And, you know, luckily Latino USA has been very, very supportive of me and allowed me to freelance. So I would come back from these reporting trips, uh, you know, do my print story and then, you know, listen to all of these interviews. And I just, I fell in love with that because there is a level of intimacy that you can't really have in print. Um, I clearly remember the story that I produced for Latino USA that ended up um, being part of that show that won the Peabody. Um, there was a couple of scenes that I don't think I could have written those in the same way that I presented them in, in the audio story because um, there's a scene specifically, I had been spending a lot of time in the shelter uh, right at the border of uh, Guatemala and Mexico in Tenosique. And um, so I was the only women journalist. So um, I had an advantage because the women who, um, who were traveling um, always slept on like one side of the shelter and no, no men were allowed. So I got to spend a lot of time with these women and I was recording everything that we're doing. And um, they had this moment when they were like, um, sort of like dreaming and like, they were just enjoying being there with each other. And they were joking about, um, you know, they were practicing their English and they were like talking about the things that were gonna buy as soon as they got to the US. And it was this really intimate, like um, moment of these women talking to each other and sharing their dreams and like laughing and, 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 and just feeling that joy of like envisioning a better future for yourself. And I don't think that I would have been able to bring that in print. So in that way, I really love audio because it, it, um, it brings voices to a different level. Can you tell us about the, um, the, the origin of that story a little bit? Um, it's so powerful. Where did you, did you go in, um, in reporting on um, the, these migrant people thinking you were going to be telling the story of these women and the bestia? Yeah, so actually it was, um, it was sort of twofold. Um, I, the story that you heard, I actually um, had gone to Mexico for a family event. Uh, my niece, it was her quinceañera, so I went to the party and all of that. And then um, I went to Mexico City um, to do this other story. And um, luckily, Latino USA you know, picked it up. Um, but the, the story that I was doing in the southern border of Mexico was actually part of a fellowship that I got. I got some funding to go and, and, and work on this story. And for a really long time, I had been doing um, work in, in Mexico and 
you know, I was always really um, struck by how much danger women face as they travel through Mexico because there's a lot of cartels, there's organized crime, there's, there's just endless um, dangers for women. And so that was my first um, story that I did about women. Um, and then from that experience, I knew that I wanted to do more. And so I started talking to a lot of people. Um, I, you know, uh, applied for this grant and, and, you know, they believed in me and they said, here, here's the money, go and do the story. I ended up spending time in El Salvador um, to look at what was happening. And then I moved to, you know, I actually pretty much spent um, like two weeks um, in the US-Mexico border along those routes and really like spending time with women and talking to them and experiencing um, and, and like watching firsthand the kinds of things that they were forced to, to endure. And, and just as we heard in this clip, you have reported on, uh, you know, also some non-serious things, but some very um, traumatic things. And I, and I know a lot of our students worry very much about reporting on subject matter, how to be sensitive, how to take, you know, not, um, not traumatize people more than they've already been traumatized. And I wondered if you have any certain um, approach um, that you have built up over time or, or what is, how do you approach those kinds of interviews and stories? I think that I have um, changed my approach over the years. Um, I've, again, like I feel like my mom is the inspiration for a lot of it. And so when I talk to migrants, uh, immigrants, um, folks who don't necessarily get interviewed by media, I spend a lot of time explaining things like who I am, my work. Um, in fact, I've played some of my work. Um, the last time I was in Matamoros, um, this woman that I was talking to, she was like, I don't really trust you. And I was like, that's fine. Like here, like, let me show you my work. And so we just had like a whole conversation and they're playing stories for her and things like that. So I take a very different approach. I, I think um, informed consent is really important for me, meaning it's not just that they agree to do the interview, it's that they understand what that entails and why I wanna do things like this. Um, and so, that's how I do it now. Um, in terms of interviewing uh, folks who have been traumatized, um, I didn't get any training for it. And uh, when I first started doing it, it was terrible. I felt like I was um, sort of making people relive their trauma and, and that felt wrong to me. Um, so now what I've been doing is sort of this uh, for uh, trauma-informed reporting, which really kind of takes the trauma into account, it really like centers that as you do the interviews. And so what I try to do now is um, one of the things that trauma survivors don't often have is control. So I try to provide as much control as possible, meaning we take breaks. If it's too much, we take breaks. Um, they are empowered to stop the interview at any given time. They are empowered to tell me, I don't wanna do this anymore. And I know that that's not a traditional approach, but I just feel like with um, folks who've experienced trauma, asking them to relive their trauma for us is hard. And they are giving so much of themselves that they, sh they deserve to have control over um, how they share their story. And if they want a break, they should get a break. You know, so um, it's it's a I don't know. I feel like it's it's a learn. It's a, it's something that I keep learning because, um, you know, I experience trauma as well. Um, and so, what I do is like I try to treat people the way that I want to be treated, all of the time. So I'm really careful. I'm really sensitive to trauma now. Um, and so I just, you know, I try to do the best I can. It's not always perfect, of course. In general, um, I mean, including trauma, but I guess in general, how do you um, build trust with um, sources, whether it's a, a, a someone who's experienced trauma or just, you know, 
being out and looking for stories. How do you build trust um, with sources and community and, and people to talk about, you know, very personal things? Yeah, I think that my approach is always to be honest with the person and to show up, keep showing up because most people, especially if you're covering disenfranchised communities, they don't have any reason to trust you, not given the history of our country, not given the history of media. And we should not take that as a dig on us. We should take that as like, let me show you who I am. If you choose to work with me, that's on you. Right. So I always try to empower people to say, you, I understand that you don't have to talk to anyone. You don't have to talk to me. And because you are doing it, I feel really privileged. I am humbled that you're trusting me with your story. Um, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about Gloria. Like I felt so privileged to be able to spend time with her. Um, she worked a lot. You know, she was like a hardworking woman. She had a lot of trauma in her life. Um, most of the time she didn't want to talk about it and that's okay. You know, it was like, it, everything was on her terms, you know, and, and I often do that. Um, and then I think people just start seeing who I am and, and what I'm about. And that's, you know, that, that sort of builds, um, within time. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, take a, a couple of the questions from folks um, that are writing in. Um, mm -hmm. So what is what do you think is unique about the um, different communities of Latinx, Latino, Latines <laughs> people in uh, Chicago land? Um, is, are there some different sensibilities? Do, are that, you know, it's a super diverse um, population, but is there something unique about covering Chicago and these sorts of issues? Um, I think Chicago is obviously very different than California. Um, there are, you know, the Mexican population is pretty big and it's actually uh, the fastest growing. Um, there is a growing number of Central American uh, folks here. Um, Puerto Ricans, obviously we cannot forget about you know, the history of Puerto Ricans in this, in this uh, city. Um, and then the Mexicans, right? Like Mexican and <laughs> Puerto Ricans. And then there's a lot of mix of that. Um, Latinos are also a really young group, like a really young demographic. So um, <clears throat> in, in, in the younger Latinx community, I think there's a lot more of a blend, like second generation, third generation. Um, but I think that for the most part, the challenge or challenges are very similar. Um, access to education, access to healthcare, um, you know, as the second generation is, you know, attending college and they're going into the professional like white collar market. Um, you know, there's a lot of, I would say, um, not only like trying to get into like the professional world, but also trying to figure out what to do with their parents, like how to communicate with them because they mostly, you know, speak Spanish. So the, it's it's a huge market that I, I think that we still have to do a better job covering um, because there's so many different complexities. There's so, and, and that's what I was trying to do with uh, the plant story that I, that I did uh, earlier this year. Um, for me, it was like, I had been, interviewing families of people who had lost someone to COVID-19 uh, for like four months straight. And I was just really worn out. I was really upset and all of the things. And so I just was like, I need to find something hopeful. And so, you know, I just, I, I mean, I did the story for everyone, but I, I mostly did it for me. <laughs> I needed a, a way to keep myself going. I, I needed to remind myself why I was doing this. I needed to feel joy again. And um, I think that um, is that a, like, I don't think it's like the specific answer that you're looking for, but I just think that um, it's such a huge population and it's only growing in Chicago. So I really hope that there's much more of an effort to cover that like second generation Latinx 
community, um, folks who don't necessarily identify as, you know, Mexican first, maybe they identify as like Chicagoan first and then Mexican American second, or, I mean, they have different identities, right? And, and I think that there's such beauty and complexity to that, that um, I just would love to keep covering those uh, types of stories. On that note, what do you think about all the attention and the, the stories about the Latino vote, the Latinx vote right now? There's a lot of really great Latino journalists doing that work. Um, Arelis over at the Washington Post, uh, Jose del Real, creo, I think that's his name, um, and the Washington Post. And I mean, the LA Times has been doing great work as well um, to try to really break down what that means. Um, and, and it feels very much like a cyclical um, conversation, right? Um, you know, George W. Bush got a pretty sizable percentage of the Latino vote. Um, a lot of Latinos are very conservative and they're Catholic. Um, abortion is a huge issue for the Latino community, um, but it, we're also very different. Cubans in Miami are very loyal to the Republican party because of the history that they've had with them, right? The, the you know, the Bay of Pigs and, 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 you know, folks being able to come into the country as asylum uh, seekers and, and being able to stay here legally, something that most other Latinos don't have. I mean, that, that policy has stopped, but um, so it, it's, it just creates different types of stories. And, and also it's just like, why are we have like why are we having this conversation again like we should be having it every year every month like how do we um better cover this community because if you look at arizona i mean arizona is a, a great example that the latino community started organizing um years and years and years ago uh first to try to get joe joe arpaio out of office then against uh, SB 1070, and they just created this like um, culture of organizing around Latinos. And, and, and it was because of that, that they turned Arizona blue. And so, you know, it is not one story of the Latino vote. It is different stories. It, it is about region, where they live in the country, where are they from? Um, how conservative are they? Um, how young are they? Because, you know, younger Cubans are not Republican, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a very nuanced uh, story that, that we're not really doing, except when everybody's surprised, you know? Um, I'm going to take another question from, from our attendees. Um, are editors as interested in immigration stories now as they were a few years ago? At a time when the country is so polarized, how can journalists increase understanding of the courage, contributions, and plight of immigrants? I mean, I'm really lucky that I'm <clears throat> I mean, my beat is immigration. So I um, have a wonderful editor who allows me to cover whatever story I want. So luckily for me, that's not a, you know, a, a, an issue that I encounter. Um, I think that we have to do a better job explaining the system so that folks understand why folks are living here without documentation or they fall in and out of status. They live in mixed um, status families. Um, there are so many different layers to that story. And I think that um, that is really what is missing. So for example, I, I just did a story yesterday um, about how the Trump administration fundamentally changed the immigration system and how he was able to do that by passing Congress, by using executive orders. He signed over 400 executive orders that changed everything from who gets to ask for asylum and where, um, res like uh, restricted legal migration greatly. Um, I mean, every, like every single aspect of immigration. And I think that people just keep having this idea, like fix your papers, get in the back of the line, um, marry someone, um, you know, even in, in pop culture, you know, this, this idea that, um, the people who enter the country without inspection can just find 
an American citizen marry that person and become, you know, and, and easily become a, a legal permanent resident is, is a wrong story. I mean, it's, it's wrong. And I think that that is at the core of why we're not even able to have a, a meaningful discussion about migration in this country because we don't understand it. So people are talking over each other about things that they don't understand. I think that that's, that's the real problem. And so when I when I cover immigration, yes, it is a story about people, but it is also a story about policy and policy really matters. Um, so I center a lot of my reporting around policy so that folks understand. Um, and it, it, at the very least, it has to be part of that, right? But um, I just fundamentally, like stories about immigrants are important but it has to have some sort of context so that folks understand. So it's not just a story about the undocumented woman who's like selling, you know, in the corner, like tamales in the corner and how she's like really struggling. It has to be a story about how we have decided that this country is going to either allow or not, not allow some immigrants according to where they're coming from and whether they can bring something, you know, technical or, you know, whether they're, um, whether, yeah, whether they can get like a, a specialized visa or, or things like that. So it's, I, I would say we have to keep telling the stories about how the system works so that people understand and, and have a nuanced conversation about why people, why over, I think it's like, 11 million uh, um, undocumented people are still living here, you know, and they do fall in and out of status um, regularly. So I would say that's what we're missing, that we're not really having the same conversation because we don't understand how the immigration system works in this country. Thank you. Um, another question from our attendees, and I would encourage folks who are watching us to continue sending them in. Um, thanks for being with us and for the reminders about best practices in interviewing and trauma survivors. What advice do you have for those of us doing that reporting across lines of nationality or gender or language or ethnicity or race or all five? Yeah. Um, I think there's a number of organizations that have put together best practices for uh, trauma-informed reporting. Um, you can actually find it in, in Borderless Magazine. It's a, it's a local magazine that um, tries to tell the stories of um, immigrants in this country, uh, in Chicago specifically, and they have a very useful like tip sheet on, on ways to report on communities of color, um, immigrant communities and things of that nature. I believe the DART Center also has a very useful um, guide for, um, you know, how to deal with an interview when someone has been traumatized or has experienced trauma. So I would say those are some of the, 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 the most um, important um, resources, but I also would say that like, most journalists should really think about their own privilege as they're coming into a space and uh, really name it and, and, and really be aware of it because um, we do have a lot of power. We get to decide which part of the story um, is shared with the world. Um, we have the power to um, really like make this person uh, go through a really difficult experience if we are not careful with what we say. Um, so I would say like take, uh, like be really humbled by the reality that like these people are really trusting their story to you and you should be really aware of that and you should be really scared and you should be really grateful that they did share that story with you. What do you think about, I mean, obviously there's been reckonings on many levels on different subjects in the last you know, year, but more than that. Um, the critique of newsrooms all over the US of the lack of uh, brown and black um, reporters and editors and staffers and sort of the, I mean, even among uh, the Chicago newsrooms, right? Um, how is our representation versus, you know, are we, are, are, 
our newsrooms representing the communities that we cover. Um, what is your feeling about um, what's happening in the industry and, the, and what's being discussed and, and the changes or no, not changes that we're seeing? I think that the public reckoning that is happening in journalism is something that journalists of color have been sharing with each other. They've been doing that for years. Um, <clears throat> we just have different tools to use. Now we have Twitter where you can have your own audience and have your own voice and say like, this is what happened. And this is the kind of stuff that I've been encountering. Um, listen, I've been, you know, I've been on the receiving end of uh, discriminatory behavior in newsrooms. I have been yelled at. I have, someone has thrown a chair at my direction. I mean, it's been, it's been terrible and crazy. Um, so I think it's time. It's needed. It's 2020. Like, let's fix it. Um, I think a lot of the work that I do um, really mirrors what Cecilia stood for, um, which is not only are, am I doing the stories and like, you know, bringing them to 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 light, but also I'm behind the scenes. I'm creating opportunities. I'm on boards, I'm talking to, to other journalists of color, I'm supporting them, I, we're plotting together, we're organizing things, I'm, tr I'm figuring out what are the things that journalists of color don't receive and how can we, how can we um, offer those things to them, right? Because I, I think that at times it's not intentional that white editors say, well, this young reporter reminds me of myself when I was young. So I'm going to teach him, this white young dude, um, how to be a journalist. I certainly felt that in my first newspaper job. I mean, part of that frustration I talked about was that I would see the difference between, you know, a colleague that was my age. Um, we have virtually the same experience. Um, and he got to go have coffee with the editor and he got to have mentoring and he got to have all kinds of things that I did not have. And so what I do now is like, I try to provide that training. I try to create those opportunities for journalists of color. Y'all may not see it and that's okay because I'm trying to build, I'm trying to build this for all of us. Like, I don't want to just be, I don't ever want to work in a newsroom again where I'm the only Latina. And that's happened many times. I don't want to do that. I'm not comfortable with that anymore. So I am very forceful in my work as well. Um, the work that you and the public will not hear. Um, and I'm really excited to see what happens. I'm really excited to see white folks coming to the table and saying, yeah, we support you. You're right, we need to change this. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited to hear students um, not changing themselves to be in newsrooms because I know that I felt like I needed to be, you know, uh, different, not be my authentic self um, as a Mexican American woman, as, as a Chicana, as a, a queer woman. I didn't feel like I could be who I was in traditional newsrooms. And I see all of these young journalists coming in and just like tearing those things down and just being authentically who they are. And I'm really excited to see that. So I see, I see a lot of hope. I agree. Um, so this is, um, I'm gonna take a question um, very specifically referring to you, I hope she doesn't mind. I'm gonna say her name, Car Carolina Gonzalez. Caro, um, I'm oh. staying here because you're referring to your relationship with, congratulations again on the award. I miss working with you and learned so many things that I am now putting into practice every day. When it comes to talking to sources on the phone now that we might not be able to go in the field uh, to report, what advice can you give us to be able to create that relationship and build that trust with them? And I'll add, how do you do radio when you have to do so much phone reporting? Or, or is that how you're doing it? So first of all, Carolina was uh, a student that I worked with 
earlier this year, she is incredibly talented and amazing. And I was very blessed to work with her. Um, to the question about telephone, it, listen, it is, it has been extremely challenging working from home during this pandemic. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, <clears throat> our newsroom um, leaders were very thoughtful and wanted to protect us. So they told us um, to really try to work from home and not go out at all. And so we got a lot of support and, and you know, we like set things up and, um, I think I got used to it by maybe like April, May. Um, and then thankfully the spike started going down and, and then we got a um, one of those boom mics. Um, so I was using those uh, during the protest. And um, I did go out to report stories of Chicagoans living without water during the pandemic. And I was using that big pole. Um, and so it, it's been really difficult, you know, like over the summer, I had like three construction sites around my apartment and it was like, well, let me go outside and like beg these workers to stop for 15 minutes so that I can go voice my story in my closet. It was, it was interesting. Um, so I think that it's really difficult to have that intimacy over the phone. It's really difficult to get people to open up over the phone. Um, I've done some Zoom interviews um, and they've been really helpful. Like I remember this interview with Julie, um, her father died of COVID-19 and I found her because um, finding people in Little Village was very, very difficult. So I ended up writing letters um, and delivered them to the houses of uh, well, the, the last known address of the person who died of COVID. So she called me when she got that letter and said, like, yes, I'm, I'm willing to do this interview. Um, let's do it. So I told her, like, I'm sorry, we can't meet in person. Let's do it on Zoom. And so Zoom was really helpful because I could see her and she felt comfortable enough that she started crying and that she, you know, felt a lot of pain, not only because she lost her father, but because she, because he died in his apartment. He couldn't even make it to the hospital, you know? And I think that as a woman who has taken care of someone very close to me, like I could see that she felt a lot of guilt around, um, this idea that like, I should have been there for my dad, but knowing that she couldn't because she also had COVID. So she was sick in her apartment. Um, she had been delivering food and medicine to him. Um, but when she got sick, she couldn't go. And, you know, when I was talking with her, I think that thing that really helped is that I was really open with my pain and my own grief. And that really opened up a lot of, I think it gave her the, the comfort to start talking about her own experiences. And it's not perfect, but I think that we, like journalists do ask a lot of people. So I, I don't think that it's bad to share a little bit about like who you are. And I think that that's sometimes that really helps. You know, like I told her, like I lost my sister like, three years ago and that destroyed me and it was really difficult. So I, I understand. And so I think that her knowing that I understood that I've, I've been where she was um, really mattered. And I think it really opened her up. How do you take care of yourself right now as, you know, doing things remotely or doing going in the field or and taking on these stories? I mean, what is your self care? I know a lot of our students are thinking about this, you know, how do you take care of yourself? Yeah, I think that <clears throat> before um, I didn't have a routine of self care. And so I really would absorb a lot of the pain that other people 
would share with me and, and I just kind of kept it. Um, but what I've been doing over the years now is that I just allow myself to feel the feelings when I'm writing. And that can be a really difficult experience. And I think that's why writing for me is like so hard and, and so painful because when I'm writing, I'm really like just letting myself like feel everything and like cry if I need to get it done. Um, I talk to colleagues as well. Like I have a very supportive, beautiful team. Um, shout out to them, Natalie, Esther, Linda, Odette, Alden. <laughs> um, they're amazing. And I feel comfortable talking to them and saying like, you know what, right now I'm having a really hard day. I'm going to take a few few hours off um the managing editor called me one day where I was like I had been working non-stop I don't know for how long um but she called me and she was like you need to take some time off. like take the rest of the day off just rest um and and I needed her to say that I really really did because I was in it like I could not really even like function I was just like I think it was like right uh, a few days after the George Floyd uprising and we had been, well, I had been in interviewing uh, families of uh, uh, folks who had died of COVID-19 with my team. And so I had like all of that trauma and then this, and then it was like nonstop. And so what I'm doing now is like, I'm trying to do that for myself. Like I'm trying to make sure that my editors don't feel like they have to step in and say like, go take a break, that I'm doing it, that I'm, you know, accountable for myself, um, resting, I'm reading a lot. I started painting again. I, you know, I go on runs all the time. I have high anxiety. So I run a lot just to, you know, deal with that part, but it's hard. I mean, it is a hard job. Like you're asking so much of folks. And then you really have to let yourself feel all of those things that they told you so that you can produce a moving story. But then it doesn't disappear. It stays with you. So you have to be really diligent about allowing those little spaces um, to do that. And, and I have a therapist too. <laughs> that always helps. Um, yes. We just have a couple more questions. You don't have much more time. Um, a total switch in, in questioning. Do you find it difficult to maintain the intention and integrity of the stories you report on through the ed editorial process? Is it easier to maintain your and your subject's voice now than, um, than it was when you started your career? You know, how do you, you know, is it, how's the editorial back and forth for you? You know, I think that the most important relationship that you have as a reporter is that with your editor. It's a relationship with your editor. It can make you or break you. And I, and, I, and I really mean that. I've had editors that absolutely broke me, like fundamentally broke me. Like I am ready to leave journalism broke me, you know, uh, but I'm really grateful that I have an editor that I, I feel like we're just a team, it's a collaboration. And I trust him fully to know that if he's suggesting a change, it's because he wants the story to be better. It is not a dig on me. It is not criticizing me or my writing. It is about making the story better. Um, and I think that the challenge with a lot of journalists of color is that at times, that relationship with your editor becomes really adver adversarial because white editors sometimes don't quite understand the complexities of marginalized communities. Um, or you may have an idea of, about how you want this story to turn out and that's not really what the editor wants, you know? Or the, the, the editor has alternative motives. Like I had an editor who uh, would come to me and tell me, go investigate this black, you know, politician. And I was like, do this, <laughs> but it's, it's, um, you know, it's really important for young journalists, especially to understand that you have to have that trust with your editor, like work really hard to get that. But if you feel 
like your editor doesn't, that, that your editor treats you differently because you're a person of color or a woman, to take a step back and try to figure out a way for you to work on your craft and try to have like a regular, like more amicable relationship with your editor, but one that doesn't question your abilities. And that's an important distinction because once you start doubting your worth, doubting, you know, whether you can do this job, everything goes out the window. So for our final question, I'll mix a, a question from the audience with my own riff. Um, do you teach, you, refer, you referred to Caro and working with her in the newsroom, but do you teach and um, what, you know, what is your, um, uh, any w message for young, um, young journalists who are aspiring to do the work that you do, who, um, what, how do you approach mentoring or teaching? So I guess first teaching and, you know, any message for a method and message for students and people who work with students? So I haven't been teaching. Um, I worked with Carolina on a story. <laughs> my gosh, I, um, I worked with her on a story and, um, you know, I really saw it as a partnership. Um, and I have been really lucky to have really great mentors. And so I really believe that I have to give back what I've received. And so I try to be really supportive of uh, young journalists of color, especially in Chicago, because we have a very small community. We sort of all know each other. Um, and I feel like I have a, a sort of a gift um, in terms of understanding where people are mentally. So for example, I went to go cover a, um, press conference a few months ago and I ran I ran into uh, a friend of mine who is younger than me um, and noticed a few things so you know I went and filed my story texted him hey how's it going how's your new gig all that good stuff and um, I was like let's go for a walk I'm gonna walk my dog we live in the same neighborhood so we, we were talking <clears throat> and quickly understood what, what was happening. And so we were able to talk through things. I was able to share how I had been in the same situation and like, what are the things that I tried to do to get out of that? Um, and, and some of the resources that I use and some of those things. And, um, you know, like, and then I, I came home and, and he was like, thank you. Like, that's exactly what I needed. Um, so I think that what I try to do is um, provide help, create opportunities. So I sit on the board for the Headline Club. And so la uh, this year, um, I organized FOIA Fest. And one of the things that I wanted to do is make sure that more journalists of color attended. So I ended up getting some money from McCormick. Thank you, McCormick. Um, to, to, uh, to be able to bring people, um, journalists of color, to this very like useful training. It was, a, it was a, a full day of workshops around the freedom of information and how to use it on your reporting. Um, and I was able to give out free tickets and I was able to provide that like space. And, um, you know, I know the founders of the IW Wells uh, Society and I've done trainings with them. I'm trying to figure out a way to bring them and do some training in Chicago again in the next couple of months. So I'm always thinking about like ways to teach, ways to help, um, ways to support each other. Um, I don't really have like a formal training or anything like that. I just know what worked for me. I know what was missing for me. And so I'm just trying to like fill in those gaps. And for our, our final question, just um, uh, this is not a few word question, but where do you think um, you'd like to see your career go? And where do you think you'd like to see journalism go? Where do you see, you know, it's such a fraught time, but you know, what are you hoping happens or what do you see happening for journalists and for yourself? Yeah, I think that we are in this really weird 
area of we are not speaking the same language in this country because we're not even using the same sources of information. And it's really fractured and it's really divided. Um, and I, you know, I have my moments of despair um, and planning for the worst because I'm a pessimist. Uh, but the hope that I do see is that there's a lot of people looking for information. There's a lot of need for that information. And so I see young people like really, like I follow some people on Instagram that are really young and they're like out in the city getting information, like uh, interested in learning about FOIA work, um, just like really smart and they have a computer in their hands. <laughs> like, and that is really powerful. So I'm, I'm really excited about like, how do we bridge that gap? Like, how do we reach to reach out to those folks who are looking for that information? Like, how do we talk to them? How do we build a, a um, you know, in, in my case, how do we build a station that is bringing in more audiences? How do we bring uh, uh, folks in? Like, how do we answer the questions that they have? How do we create stories that move us, um, that move us into action? Um, into fixing the things that need to be fixed. Um, and, and I see a lot of opportunities uh, because there are so many untold stories. And a lot of those people are taking to social media to tell their own stories. And so like, what would it look like for us to partner or like to harness um, th that desire to share stories? Um, so I see a lot of really great possibilities. I think that it's really going to, um, is really gonna come down to whether people are ready to face the fact that we need more diversity in the newsrooms. And I, I don't just mean, let's put out a statement. Yes, we agree. I mean, are you willing to give up your power so that more diverse voices come in? I don't think we're ready to have that conversation. I don't think most people want to have that conversation. But that is where, where we are. I see a lot of hope, but I also think that the reckoning has to happen with everyone. Well, thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you, Mayling. It's been wonderful. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Have a good one. Adios. Ciao. Bye.